this panel presentation is connected to the Latinx Vis Visions Conference, which starts tomorrow. Uh, it's going to be amazing. There will be um, more artists and also um, literary arts and um, humanities uh, related to this I idea of um, Latinx futures. Um, that uh, conference is organized by the Department of Chicana and Chicano Studies. Um, and in conjunction with that, there's an exhibition at the Harwood Sixth Street Gallery and a performance by Angel Cabrales um, at the National Hispanic Cultural Center. Uh, and that has all been curated and organized by wonderful Bianca Caramillo, um, who is a museum studies graduate student and a STEAM New Mexico America Vista. Uh, STEAM New Mexico is a project of the College of Fine Arts uh, to raise capacity for STEAM education in the state. And we have a home base in the Viz Lab right next door at Carsey. Um, so this event is also part of a laser series that's hosted by an organization called SciArt Santa Fe. Uh, lasers stand for a Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous. And it's a global movement. Um, it's, uh, there are lasers in about 30 countries around the world. And there's some in Portugal, I think, more, maybe more than one. Um, so a uh, big thank you to Leonardo for kind of starting that initiative uh, a few years ago and um, helping us to be a part of it. Um, SciArt Santa Fe uh, th is grateful for the support of the, National, uh, the New Mexico Humanities Council, New Mexico Arts, and the NEA. Um, a video of this will be online um, and shot and edited by the wonderful Jared Rendon Trompak. Um, and uh, so thank you to Jared for all of his work. And huge thank you to all the artists participating. It's wonderful. I'm, I'm so excited to see what's happening. And finally, thank, to you, thank you to you for coming. And I will pass it on to Bianca. Thanks. Oh, and I'm Andrea Pulley. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Andrea. And thank you all for coming to this very important event, series of events that is happening for me to get my master's in museum studies for curation. Um, so this evening, we will discuss several questions that relate to the topic of my thesis project, which is Chicano Futurism derived from Latinx futurism. Ch Chicano futurism focuses on the future of Mexican American culture here in the United States. Through the power of art, we get to see the utopic or dystopic views of Chicano or Chicana people that question their own future based on present events. So I would like to go down the row and introduce um, the artists that are here with us today and thank them so much for being here and making the time for it. Uh, let's first introduce our online artist, Delisa. Hola, como están? How are you doing? Pretty good, thank you. How are you doing? Good, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it so much. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. Yeah, uh, talk, talk a little bit about yourself and about your artwork. Um, hold on, a technical. Um, okay, I'm, my name is Lisa Hauriki. Um, I'm from oh, South Phoenix. One, one minute, please. Sorry. Um, I just wanted uh -huh. to let you know to if you want to go to this through the slides, it's the up arrow and the down arrow. Okay, you got it. Okay, so Lisa, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I'm a practicing artist now for about um, 37 plus years, uh, maybe a little bit more, maybe 40. Um, so I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. I'm from South Phoenix, the barrio there. Um, I grew up in South Phoenix. Uh, I taught in the Yaqui Res. Um, I'm Yaqui, I'm indigenous, I'm Mexicana. Uh, Mexican identity is something that has been a great interest in, to me since I am a Chicana. Um, when I say I'm Mexicana, I mean I'm sangre Mexicana, I'm blood Mexican. I'm not um, nationally from Mexico. So I want to make that distinguish um, because many times 
in the past during colonialism, they tried to um, get do away with the concept of indigeneity of being a Mexicana blood Mexicana. Um, I grew up speaking Spanish, but I also grew up speaking Nahuatl. So in my stat in my um, family, we spoke um, Central Mexican Mexica language, the Nahuatl. So that played an important role um, in shaping my art. Um, I also have uh, my degrees in philosophy, so um, a lot of my art is philosophically based. And and it's based on uh, indigenous philosophy as well as postmodernism, uh, which is my forte. So um, also I live and work in New York City and Connecticut. And I was the first Mexicana to exhibit at the Met. And I've been working with the Smithsonian and exhibiting and lecturing at the Smithsonian for the last 22 years. And I helped shape their Dia de los Muertos um, curriculum and festivities um, for those 22 years. <laughs> <laughs> I could go on for hours because I'm a also I teach philosophy so I can easily go into a, a three hour seminar so I cut it there so thank you for having me and if you have any questions I would love to you know answer <laughs> thank you so much Lisa uh, now I'll introduce Sarah hi everybody my name is Sara Cardona um I am also a Mexicana, but I was born in Mexico City. Um, so I actually consider myself a Mexicana. I have a lot of family there. I travel back and forth. But I moved here, as many um, young people do, when I was a teen. And I have lived in Dallas, Texas for a long time. And my family, my mother naturally chose to uh, migrate to um, the most Mexican part of Dallas she could find. So I grew up in a solidly Chicano neighborhood, Mexican-American neighborhood. Uh, my mother's family is uh, from the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. Um, so my grandmother is of uh, Zapotec uh, background. I grew up listening to Zapoteco. I don't really speak Zapoteco, but I do identify um, indigenous roots as a very important part of my formation. Even though I look, uh, obviously, you know, I probably on the range of things look very um, much like one of the European, uh, uh, you know, Mexicanas. And I think this is part of, um, you know, the beauty of our spectrum is that we are all so many things. Um, in terms of growing up in a Chicano neighborhood, though, I um, really, the work that my, my family did uh, was um, very rooted in activism to uplift the community here in, in Dallas. So um, my family is, um, uh, my background uh, growing up is my mother founded a theater here called Teatro Dallas in Dallas, Texas. My father did lighting for television and film. And um, this has been a huge influence on my artwork. When I moved here with my family, uh, my mother couldn't find any kind of work as an actress or a director, even though she had been uh, formed uh, with a very solid background in theater and the arts in Mexico City. And so she started the theater here, which I grew up in, um, giving voice to the Chicano community, specifically Mexican-American community, but also has always um, given this city a, a global lens to really explore our intersections of culture, um, our Afro-Indigenous, our Afro roots, our indigenous roots. Um, so in terms of my art practice, um, the work that I do is has a lot of influence of, of theater and performance. Even though I'm not a performance artist, uh, I really see the future. My, my pers particular perspective about futurism has a lot to do with place and performance and using our body and our voice. Um, so somehow that plays uh, very much into my work. Um, I'm a collage artist. That's the foundation of most of the work that I do, but I, I explore all kinds of material. And um, so I'll leave it at that for right now. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, now we'll go to our live artists that are here with us today. First off, we'll start with Angel Corrales. Hello. Uh, so I am uh, from El Paso, Texas. Um, 
my I didn't find out till 12 years after my my grandpa died that he was um, Raramuri that he came down from the mountains and uh, so at one of that learning that really made me want to learn a lot more about my own indigenous blood uh, and learn more about being who I am with my parents constantly telling us that we need to be proud of being Mexican-American and yet not knowing my indigenous side which is a big part of it uh, so a lot of my work started researching that trying to figure out where we came from and, and really learning more and more of my roots uh, my background um, started in the sciences. My dad's an engineer, uh, was an engineer. He's retired from White Sands Missile Range, so I grew up around missiles. And my mom uh, was uh, politically active. Uh, she would go and register people to vote. She ran for state rep in New Mexico. She was very active in helping the community. So I, I'm uh, this amalgamation of the two of art, science, and political commentary. Um, I'm also the sculpture professor at uh, UTEP, and um, I'm going to leave it at that so we can talk. So the others can talk. Next, we have Sarah Mills, who is a local Albuquerque <coughs> resident and an artist. Um, uh, I probably have the least to say <laughs> among everyone, but um, I work for Andrea Poli as her lab manager. Um, I actually don't know a lot about my family history. Unfortunately, my uh, granddad, he had all of that information and he put it in a storage unit. And unfortunately, he had a stroke and we lost the storage unit. So my family history is a, it's a bit of a mystery for me, but I am looking into it. Um, I do know that he, that my great-great-grandfather was a Spanish Jew, he married a full-footed Cherokee, and uh, my grandmother has Japanese in her blood, and it's a, it's a large melting pot, <laughs> for sure. But um, my art isn't currently focused around my history, but I have been dealing with health issues and you know depression for a while. So my pieces tend to show what I feel. And so that's why the like the faces I draw tend to be like sad and whatnot. But it's something I'm working on and um, it's something that will progress and change with my feelings and you know whatever I'm passionate about but uh, art is my passion so I'm looking forward to what I'll create in the future so um, but yeah and Sarah is our representative of Afrofuturism in my show to show the foundation of certain futurisms that made Latina futurism that made Chicano so it's important to have um, these different aspects of Afro, Indigenous, and um, other bases to know how Chicano futurism came to be what it is now. Next we have Luis Aldera. Hi, I'm Luis Aldera. Um, I'm originally from uh, McAllen, Texas, the La Frontera. That's uh, the spot in between uh, Laredo and Brownsville. And um, so uh, I grew up there uh, and um, I grew up in a flower of ceramic shop, so my practice is influenced by by everything we did in the ceramic shop and the flower shop, and we were constantly making objects for celebrating the customs that we uh, celebrate as uh, as uh, Mexican Americans, the yeah, Los Muertos, the Mother's Day, Father's Day, uh, the flores for uh, for the funerals. So these objects and the practice that I, I followed in the ceramic shop kind of led to my practice developing into what I make. Um, I traveled around a lot. I was in a punk rock band uh, in my early days, and, and so I ended up in Dallas and went to art school. Um, after that, after I dropped out from art school, I came back home and uh, to the Valley, and I started uh, my education all over again. Um, and that's when I uh, kind of got turned on to Mesoamerican art because of my professor, Sandra Swanson. She was a gemstone, and she I knew Linda Sheely really well, so she would bring her in often to talk uh, 
about how she was breaking the Mayan code and got to meet her a couple of times and that just kind of fired me up to really get involved in learning about Mesoamerican uh, mythology and the sculptures and all the aesthetics as well as um, uh, back in the in my punk rock days I started listening to uh, uh, Sun Ra and I, that turned me on to just thinking about uh, just the cosmic thing uh, stations that we're at and then uh, when I moved to San Antonio uh, back in 2000 um, I ran into all the Chicano artists that live in San Antonio that um, Jose Esquivel, Jesus Chista Cantu, uh, uh, Joe Lopez, uh, all those uh, all those barrio guys that were uh, in the middle of everything back in the 60s and uh, started the Chicano art movement uh, uh, con sapos uh, in, the, in 68. So um, as a matter of fact, Jose Esquivel was my mentor. He just recently passed away. So a lot of what I have done has been by listening to my mentors and then just applying and exploring uh, because of my fascination with Mesoamerican art and outer space. One of the first things I remember uh, my youth was sitting in front of the TV set watching the black and white uh, moon landing. And so that just kind of stayed in my head and, and kept working. And, and um, as I developed my work, uh, uh, I, uh, I saw people were doing, uh, in, in San Antonio were, creating work that was cosmic and had a connection with uh, our, our roots in the stars. And so I founded, I co-founded Project Masa, uh, which is a, a, a group of Chicanos that were in outer space, basically. And this was after I met uh, uh, the guys from uh, the Royal Chicano Air Force. Um, when I came to Arizona in, in 2005 and sat down and had a platica with them. And I was really turned on by um, how they used the whole idea of parody and a happenstance and then a recreation of, of reality with their reinterpretation of codices and, and, and their studies about what they were doing and, and renaming them. So that just uh, ignited me to say, why not? Why can't we have our own space uh, uh, program? And so Project Massa started and we did uh, collective exhibits uh, for three years. Um, then there was a hiatus. I went through a divorce and a lot of tumultuous uh, time and. And um, I'm still making artwork at the same time, and, and uh, just recently did uh, Project Masa uh, 5, uh, which now I'm just producing, um, and I'm not involved in the, in the exhibiting, um, which uh, was also uh, an all women's show, and the show was called Mars Needs More Women. And so um, <laughs> at this point, I'm, I'm also manufacturing rockets um, based on the avocado seeds that my mom used to plant. Um, in our backyard because we have five avocado trees and we get uh, which is like full of avocado and we'd have all these leftover seeds and she plant them and sell them and so when when they're coming out of the ground they they, they, they look like little missiles or rockets and that stuck with me and that's that's why I make those rockets and and uh, and um, they're all numbered and I'm going to continue expanding on that so um, but there's a lot more we can talk about Next, we have Ivan Esparza. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Ivan Esparza. Uh, I think I'm the baby here. I just graduated uh, last fall for, uh, from UTEP. I'm currently living in El Paso. I was born in Ciudad Juarez. Uh, immigrated here to the U.S. 13 years ago. Uh, I think uh, most of my work explores the border culture. I mean, borders are so magical places you can find a lot of people, uh, a lot of ingenuity on, 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 on the people living in there. <clears throat> so, yeah, I guess I've always been a fan of sci science fiction and, and I mean, I've been living my more than half of my life over there on, on Mexico. And I'm, I guess I, I like to relate those to, to, those, to those things, right? And try to create something unique and, and, and something that uh, inspired uh, other artists and, and other people to explore their culture, basically. And I don't know, I think that's pretty much it. Alright, well thank you guys so much for being here again and thank you. Um, I'll give a little bit about me and why I'm here at this location at this right now. Um, so I got my undergraduates in Brownsville, Texas with studio art, wanted to become an artist, but instead got into the museum field there, 
and I ended up working there for about three and a half years, wanting to advance my career in this field. So I decided to go for my master's in museum studies and realizing uh, through the different processes of, of different departments and museums, I wanted to be in the curation department, specifically because I still want to be involved with the art and the artist. That means so much for my career to actually have a happy life. Um, art is such a meaningful entity in my life that I have to have it not only here, but in my career for actually me to have a meaningful life. <laughs> uh, but for this exhibition, um, it all started when I moved to Albuquerque. In Brownsville, Texas, there is not a lot of proud representation of Chicano, Chicana people. Chicano, Chicana is kind of looked at as a term of like, oh, you're from California, or oh, you're in a gang. No positivity like it is here. Um, so when I moved up here, I got so much uh, positive feedback. I got so much you know, interaction with other Chicano, Chicanas that uh, represented themselves as that. So when I wanted to pick my thesis topic, I definitely wanted to have that Chicano uh, culture in the topic, but I didn't know how. So being influenced by other artists and futuristic um, views that I love, uh, I decided to do Chicano futurism because there is not a lot of information about it right now, as obviously you know, uh, but it is coming up, especially in the museum field. So I wanna be on that forefront for Chicanos and Chicanas and give them that lift that they need to represent Chicano futurism. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start with the question. Um, so first question that I have for all my artists. Um, sorry, wrong page. <laughs> How would you define Chicano futurism, in your words. And we'll go ahead and start off with Elisa. Okay, um, well, Chicano futurism is something that I've been thinking about a lot since I'd say about uh, two or three de decades. Um, I, my doctoral studies is in education. So coming from South Phoenix, I taught all over the South Phoenix, um, including the community college. And then I went on to ASU, I was a US, uh, a borderlands scholar um, at the Chicano Studies Department. So um, I, the time that I grew up in versus the time that is now is was drastically different. Um, maybe similar to what you grew up in, uh, Bianca, um, because the institutions were basically locking us out. Anything that wasn't white, Anglo-centric was not something that was necessarily um, desirable within like museum curation specifically. Um, like I said, in 2008, I was the first Mexicana, uh, Chicana in, at the Met. So that is both exciting, but really kind of horrible too. Um, and the same with the Smithsonian, only now are we talking about the Latino museum that's going to go on. So I created curriculums. Um, I wanted to promote an indigenous uh, Chicano futurism. So I did that by um, uh, conceptually placing mirrors, but also scholastically in, in terms of scholarly um, education. I, I did that too. I wanted to present um, as the Mexica aesthetics, um, specifically based in the codices. Um, and I looked to, to what I wanted to be as a human being, like what, what are my options out there? So I am a philosopher, I'm a continental and analytic philosopher. Um, I'm also raised by curanderas, so I know a lot about curanderismo. Um, I wanted to integrate all of my aspects and not have any kind of denial of it. So the closest thing that I came to was a clamatimini or a miklamatimini, 
which was the Mexica term and the concept of the philosopher artist, uh, someone who was within the community that uh, allowed, that placed, literally placed mirrors in front of the person in order for the person to see themselves. So my material, my medium is ground up mirrors or ground up stars. Um, it's glitter. So I conceptually use glitter as a reflection of ourselves. And also in terms of identity, it's in unity that we have an identity. And in unity, you see the color of the glitter, but individually we sparkle. So there's also, I wanted to bring in the concept of Oyin, O-L-L-I-N, which is the Mexica concept of movement. It's similar to Chi. Um, it's it's a, an, an energy. So um, the glitter came in as part of a Mexica and also part of a postmodernism as well. Um, and I talk about postmodernism in terms of philosophy and art, not art history. There's um, what I see severe differences between how art historians um, define philosophy, uh, define postmodernism and how philosophers define postmodernism. Um, so I'm, my work is very much in terms of, of bringing, again, the historical past to to the people to have like that um, that pride and also to teach. Um, so I made it very easy to see the gods and the goddesses in my work. It was very easy to see them because a lot of times whenever I was teaching, it was difficult for people to see. The other um, thing in terms of uh, Chicano futurism is that I wanted to literally educate. Um, so I created curriculums. Um, I created curriculums all over Arizona, I worked for the Getty, um, and I, I created, I helped uh, create protest curriculums in um, the turn of the century, <laughs> in the late 1990s, early 2000s, to teach Chicanos how to protest. <laughs> and I used the artists, Chicano artists, like the Royal Chicano Air Force, um, individual artists, Esther Hernandez, Yolanda Lopez, in order to show that we need to protest because we're being institutionally left behind and I wanted to promote like education and pride in education and finding out that yes I am indigenous yes colonialism kept it so that we were still a los de abajo so I wanted to raise that up so those are some aspects um, within my own practice um, and and I've, I've also like I've, I've done <laughs> a lot in the U.S. Um, so I helped establish what the Smithsonian was teaching nationally about Dia de los Muertos, about um, Mesoamerican culture, about Mexica culture, about Chicano culture. So um, again, I have lots of threads, lots of hilos going. Um, so that's, I'll, I'll end it there. <laughs> but so that's somewhat of my background. Thank you, Felisa. Uh, Sarah, what does Chicano futurism mean to you? Or how do you define it? Um, well, my aesthetic is kind of grounded in um, my interest in the knowledge and the great technology and service of cosmic connection that our ancestors had. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, architecture, the great sciences, the math, all of the things that are the foundation for what we have today um have you know our our predecessors developed that but they developed them i'm not and i'm not going to be romantic about it yes they were imperialists as well um so they they did build empires but in general i feel that um those technologies were in the service of a, a much more holistic way of living that um was in placing us in relationship to the cosmos and to the earth. And so to me, futurism is um, centered in the past. In other words, everything that is ancient is future. And so in my work, I really like to investigate um, and specifically architecture, patterning, design that came from um, for me, because I, I, as I mentioned, my family is from Oaxaca. I grew up going to a lot of these sites when I was little, uh, like Monte Alban and Mitla 
And um, I was always fascinated by, by um, just the beauty of the kind of simplicity. And you see that a lot in Mexico City and urban structures. There's a repetition of that, you know, um, and there's different terms for it, brutalist architecture. But I find it very beautiful um, to see the um, endless reinvention of that. Um, I think for me, futurism uh, is this idea that uh, we can reconnect to that past and we repeat things because we've been colonized, because we have been broken from that. We find new and inventive ways of um, of taking that manifestation and it and, and it works its way out in uh, in humor. Um, I think a lot of Chicano work is deeply grounded in humor because our ancestors also had a very strong sense of sacred profane. So um, from a, a perspective of theater, what I've learned about uh, Mexica theater and um, and rituals within uh, you know the communities of Oaxaca is that while they were connecting in with the most sacred ways, they were also using humor and body and performance, and it was really about creating uh, a circle. And so um, I think uh, what interests me about futurism is the ways in which we can pull these things and see and unpack them and see the past in our present. Um, I personally find, uh, you know, what most people look at as like tags and graffiti, a type of um, structural language that is not unlike the kind of language that you find on temples where there are different codes or ways that people speak to each other or levels of understanding that are visual culture. So, um, you know, when I walk around a neighborhood and I see a lot of very colorful uh, types of tags and, and lettering, I see a direct parallel with the ways in which um, you look at ancient sites that have uh, glyphs and language, and there is um, a kind of a performance on the buildings. So things are public. Um, the structures are are meant to be experienced and to li be lived in, to be shared. Um, and so with my work, what I try to do is find these parallels and bring them together because I don't really, I think our future uh, as a community is um, not just endlessly repeating forms, but understanding where they came from in the past and connecting them directly to our future. Um, that's the that's the work of, of healing and repair. But that, that I think happens um, as you were mentioning, specifically through the artist, the artist has a kind of a modern role, uh, I guess as a shaman in the sense of being a, a, a healer and opening up spaces for people to connect and to experience things together because um, the true role of, of, of a shaman is to create a space where people uh, bring that energy together. And, and so that's what interests me also about theater and how it connects to the visual arts. It's it's a place of uh, the performer is never alone. You, you The audience brings that energy too. And um, I like visual art that, that requires um, maybe in a way when you're talking about the mirror, it's a bit of that as well. It's, it's uh, we are reflecting one another continuously. So, um, I probably didn't sound quite as eloquent as <laughs> some of the other artists here, but it is something I've been thinking about the the this uh, back and forth between the past and the present. Thank you, Sarah. And now we will go to our live artist. And um, what, how would you define Chicano features in Asia? Um, I guess futurism for me, uh, I'm a multimedia artist, and I was born in the borderlands. So a lot of my work originally would talk about issues at hand that were happening at the border. But I'm also a big sci-fi nerd, and um, I always saw sci-fi movies as ways to really get people to talk about topics that they didn't want to talk about, but subvert them in a way where you didn't really realize you had that topic. So 
you can bring up topics of immigration, but you make them aliens, or they're in the future, or they're in a different timeline, and so now you can actually take in this concept without applying it to yourself. So you push it away, and yet at the same time bring it in. So you make a person comfortable with the topic before you go, hey, let's really talk about what's at hand. Um, so a lot of my work originally was very dystopic as, as words of warning. It's like, if we continue in this direction, this is where we're headed. But at the same time, I wanted something more hopeful. And uh, when I was in graduate school, I had a professor who kept telling me, this, like, you're this world builder. He's like, he's like, I don't know if you realize it, but every time you're making your artwork, you're like creating these, these different worlds. And, and I sat there, and especially during the pandemic, because everything was just so depressing. I wanted something that was more uplifting. And you know, really wanting to know more about myself, um, really realizing, you know, as you grow up, uh, well, I grew up in the, in the 80s, really, and talking to my parents where they were like, you need to be a proud Mexican-American. And then you're like, great, well, what is that? And they're like, well, here's your Spanish side. And I was like, okay, but where's the rest? And they're like, well, we don't really know. And then I come to find out that my grandfather was 100% Ramu. He, he lived in there, but he never spoke about it because he was ashamed. And no one in the family talked about it. And I didn't find out until 12 years after he died. He lived to 100. Hmm. You know, and, and, and suddenly I'm like, well, that makes me like at least a quarter. You know, and, and really wanting to learn more and then learning that my grandma was from Oaxaca and, and not really being able to find the familial lines, but wanting to know at least, at least more about the people. And, and so I started to find hey, you know what, there's a lot that I can relate to in this, that especially when it comes down to like sciences and mathematics, because, you know, like I said, my dad was an engineer. I didn't have a Game Boy as a kid. He gave me this glorified calculator that looked like a robot called the Data Man, and I played math games. You know, so finding out that the Maya had the concept of zero, like in 2000 BC is incredible, you know, and, and being able to find all these, these the, the vulcanization of rubber, or, you know, the hybridization of corn, and, and you start finding there's a lot of intelligence here that I never learned, you know, about Mesoamerica, where it's like, well, you know, the Aztecs, like, they, they sacrifice people. It's like, well, I'm sure that everybody's killed someone in the name of God in our history, right? So I was like, well, I want to learn more. So I started doing more research, and I wanted to build a new world of what if. And, and especially when you start thinking about like multiverse theory, it's like, well, if you can think about this concept of where this timeline could have diverged, then theoretically, that world actually does exist. You know, and, and so I really loved building this world um, of as technonauts and myathmeticians and Olmec chemists and sapotechnical engineers and now artists and in computer scientists and and com completing and, and growing this universe. It's like, I want to, I want to involve all indigenous tribes into creating this, this world of the Western hemisphere of, of positivity of like, this is what, this is who we are. This is our potential. And, and, and bring this love of who we are from this earth here. You know, this is where our blood comes from. And that, that futurism to me is like, embracing where we come from so that we can show our true potential. Um, so, I don't know if I answered your question, but that, that's what I see. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Angel. Uh, for Sarah, uh, since she is uh, representing Afrofuturism, and this being her first uh, piece related to Afrofuturism culture, uh, can you give us a little <laughs> explanation of basically uh, what you think Afrofuturism means to you? Well, since I'm so new to it, um, I don't have a history of pieces and whatnot of these amazing artists. But I think this is a chance to uh, show people of color, you know, African Americans, that we have a history that just doesn't start from slavery. Like, we tend to learn throughout school years, 
they don't teach a lot of like the positive histories. And um, I think this is a great chance and opportunity to show young kids and, and people who are growing up in, in school now that we do come from greatness. And um, I think that if they know that they have greatness in their history, they have a chance to believe that they can be great and do better things and go further. So I think this is a, is a good opportunity to, you know, help bring that out in it. And, you know, through my art. So, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Uh, for Luis. Well, um, you know, it, it, I've read extensively uh, in different areas that have interested me after I was exposed to Mesoamerican art history. And um, I, I was, like Ankara, I was fascinated with science fiction. That, that, that um, moon landing blew my mind. And, and as it has for that generation, because that generation was just uh, inspired by the stars. Um, and so I think uh, for me, the, the, when I started making stuff, I really didn't call it that. I just started making stuff. And uh, then people just said, hey, that looks kind of like science fiction-y. What, what are you thinking about? And so the concept of time is a construct that human beings have created and have dealt with throughout our entire history. and. It vacillates back and forth in ideas of what it means and and how we express it. But at the end of the day, um, we're back at the same circle, just like in um, Quetzalcoatl's tail. Uh, he's eating his tail on the on the great calendar stone, like the Ouroboros. And 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 the implication is that this moment right here, where that we're at, is happened both in the past and will be happening in the future at the same time. And so examining the idea of time being this object, this and then we're, we're objects embedded into the time frame, the slices of time that are happening and how they're all uh, occurring at the same time. And you can read Michio Kaku and, and some of his uh, details about uh, how quantum physics and examining the, micro, the smallest particles of matter uh, influences them. Um, and then other philosophers um, and all other mathematicians, um, I started thinking about how the words of the ancients really are words that are veiled to tell us the secrets of science without the formulas. So you understand the concept by knowing, learning the words of the ancients, and then you sit down with the scientists to look at the, at the formulas to see how you can define that point in, in time-space continuum with the XYZ node and then thinking about how the vastness of the cosmos is all within us at the same time. So for me, Chicano Futurism is a form of seeking agency through decolonization of our present into the future. And as much as we can imagine, we can make it happen because our words have power. So I can be a rocket manufacturer, a Chicano rocket manufacturer in, in the scene. And, um, and I have agency by saying that. Um, just like Angel is talking about how um, his chemists and his mathematicians have agency and he gives them names. And, um, and so that is what Chicano Futurism is the seeking of agency through, through um, decolonizing by using science fiction, by using metaphysics and ideas of the cosmos and spirituality all in the same time to reimagine um, a new world that, um, where these hybridized images exist at the same time. And it's, I mean, you, you go back to, it, it's been happening quite a bit, it, you know, uh, we, we can see it in, in film, and we can see it in, in modern film as well. Earliest versions of, uh, of science fiction that finally brought in um, a Chicano with James Edward Olmos in Blade Runner, and he made up his own language, uh, which was a mix of 
of indigenous uh, and Chinese and English and, and, and then, then bring it all the right back to Alex Rivera with his sleep dealers and the issues that we deal with presently as a gente um, trying to work. You know, my father was constantly working. He was a jack of all trades and, and uh, he would tell us stories. So that's another thing that I see happening with Chicano Futurism is that we bring our own stories and make them real. Um, we piece together the histories that we have, um, just like you having lost some of your history. Um, I've lost a lot of my history in um, the photographs of my of, uh, older uh, relatives and ancestors that I don't have anymore. Um, and all that remains is just the stories that I would uh, remember from my father telling me those stories. So based on those stories, I recreate uh, futures and, and new realities and I named them, and, and I think that a lot of Chicano features that I see in, or people working within the, the frame um, also place themselves in, into, the, into the work as, as alter egos um, and, and um, functioning within this new reality that they create. So, um, but that's what I've seen since the 90s. So, um, Lisa, I think you can also agree to that as um, having a longer view on things really allows you to see the direction of where they could possibly go and it's exciting because um, we're decolonizing and, and it's happening uh, with agency that we can get and it's happening through education. I'm, I'm an educator as well. I've taught 30 years in the public school system. Uh, I, uh, I uh, teach at Northside ISD, those cougars. The girls just won the, the basketball championship of the state, and, and um, also um, Dr. Watson is a, a, a Cougar uh, alumni as well. So I think that um, we all gather together at the right time, at the right place, to make the impact, and, and we've been here before. That's what I want to remind you of. We've been here before. The it, energy does not disappear, it just gets placed into different locations and ready for all the things to be in place for it to manifest itself as us. And we've... That's, yeah. it's, it's also to, to uplift each other, mm -hmm. I mean, and help each other. I mean, Delisa was one of my professors. Mm -hmm. She helped uplift me and open my eyes in the direction that I should go in. You know, and, and that's how we all help each other and, that, and there's that intergenerationality of Chicano futurism as well that I want to make sure that we talk about because um, the Chicano artists from the 60s they were talking about being the La Raza Cosmica and they were seriously there was some serious research into into um, indigenous spiritual practices and it revealed itself in their works and and um, and it's we've been talking about it since then and before. And so uh, those mentors that have been giving back, like at least being your mentor and professor, Jose Esquivel, um, and, and I'm sure that you all have mentors as well. You just gotta reach back and, and remember and, and touch base with them. But that's another aspect of Chicano Futurism, which is the intergenerationality of it. It didn't just happen overnight. It, it's, been, it's been growing like a seed, and it's been, it's been uh, um, nurtured by all the activists and all the artists that have been contributing to La Causa, to El Movimiento, and then to the education. And of course the newer generations are gonna be into, um, instead of black and white TV, I, I want the stereo system with the colors, color TV, and, and then they're gonna be progressing into the new technologies that make us part of, of this reality that we function in. You know, the cell phone. And it, 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 that's, uh, I teach kids that are uh, digital, that are digital natives. They've never known a time without um, the internet. They've never known a time when you just leave without your phone or you're out there and it doesn't matter because you're in the middle of nowhere and it's, it's where you are. And it reminds you of how small you are in the cosmos, but what great part that we play. And so, I mean, I'll stop there. And <laughs> <laughs> um, sure, so. I think like Sarah, I'm still exploring Ch uh, Chicano futurism and my background as a uh, Mexican. And then, um, but I think I see Chicano futurism, futurism as a way to challenge like 
persistent narratives and stereotypes about for immigrants, and a way to share our culture, our our roots, and and yeah, just try to see uh, hope with the hopes that people can see there that we are more more than uh, just immigrants or rapists or whatever the narrative is right now. Uh, that we have a future in this country, that we can help grow this country. Uh, that's the way I see you know, that futurism. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Uh, so I guess, and from my point of how I would define Chicano futurism, um, like uh, Luis was saying, coming from a place uh, where Chicano wasn't really used as a proud word, and even for my family history, um, asking my parents, where did we come from? Where, you know, where do our great great grandfather, grandpa, uh, grandmothers come from? And they don't know. That family history, like Sarah's, is gone. And it will be very lucky if I could find some type of paper trail that leads me to that. But overall, I'm pretty much lost that knowledge of my family history. The closest I can get is that I do have both of my uh, mother and father come from Mexico. One from Michoacan, um, my father he doesn't know. And none of my other family members on both sides don't know either. So when Chicano Futurism was my, I decided to make that my topic, it's, it's personal for me as well. Because growing up in Brownsville, I didn't have that pride. I didn't have that, you know, I just, you know, was an American. Didn't didn't see the the importance of representing my Mexican blood that I had in my veins. And I wish I knew what I knew now, of course. We all say that, right? <laughs> um, but if I had that same knowledge when I was younger living in Brownsville, I think my life would be a lot different. But I do not regret my life. I do not regret the way I came up. Um, the fact that I know it now is the best thing that I've ever done in my life. So, because I just feel more of a bond, not only with this culture that we live in now, and, but me my Mexican culture. You know, it's, it's a bond that it's, it's almost indescribable. And that has almost empowered everything that I do when it comes to curation, the meaning behind specific uh, either cultures or genres that I'm going to be representing in exhibitions that I make are gonna have that deep connection because I feel the audience needs that as well. Because you can go to any online thing, look at a picture and be like, that's cool. But if you were to go to an exhibition, you know, my hope is when you see a piece and you see an explanation or you get to meet the artist themselves, you know, and they explain to you, that hits you in a place that you never thought that it would hit you. And that's what I want my future exhibitions to mean and what Chicana Futurism means for the museum world. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, now we will go into the pieces that these artists have brought to this amazing show that right now is at the Harwood that will open on the 11th. Um, Fortaleza, uh, for everybody, um, <laughs> how do you feel or what does your piece represent for this show? So, the hey, so, um, so uh, I submitted two pieces. Um, one of them is the Axis Mundi, uh, which is the centering of the self within the universe. Um, and um, as our wonderful guests, fellow artists have also uh, said, um, I, I also, of course, am a science and math nerd. Um, I was top of my class in math <laughs> and mm -hmm. science. Um, and I actually uh, helped with the uh, editorial and the informational process for uh the Maya 2012 for the Smithsonian. So I created uh, curriculums and I, I helped edit those. Um, so again, the centering of the self within the universe, um, and within Mexica um, ideology, uh, there is four directions, there's five. And the fifth direction is the self. 
Um, and they also, we also have this concept of the axis mundi or the, the universal tree from which we derive life. Um, in, in Maya um, scholar, well, in Maya culture, it's the Seba tree. Um, and so I used uh, the axis mundi that I made was um, there's a lot of keys, conceptual keys in there, and I don't necessarily always give those away. So there's little secrets in there. And if you can figure them out, then they'll even be more of a, of a, oh, uh, kind of like the Eureka moment. moment. Um, so I also see my work as koans. Koans, uh, and this is a reflection of it. Koans are um, um, little, Jap uh, usually it's a Japanese word for, um, kind of like uh, 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 math um, language equations that you figure out, right? So that within the Axis Mundi piece um, is a koan. Um, so there's a few concepts going into that in terms of like universality and uh, being ontology in terms of philosophy. Um, the next piece I used was I wanted something to, to represent the universe. Um, so again, whenever you look at the, the second piece, it's you see yourself reflected. Um, and it's the concept of the stars. Again, it's like placing us amongst the stars and the ancestors, our ancestors are the stars looking down at us within uh, the Mexica framework. So um, those were two of the aspects. The, the third one is bringing in um, the concept of, of Oyin and movement. Movement is change, basically. Um, so I see... And I and Luis has mentioned this as well. We see the change that has happened these past at least 22, 32 years um, that at least that I've been participating in since the 90s and the 80s. We've seen the change uh, within the culture itself. Um, and I also wanted whoever's looking at the uh, artwork to be reflected into the artwork and brought into the artwork. So the environment and whoever is viewing the piece is also contributing and defining what the piece is. Um, so those were the, the two important parts, again, like grounding ourselves within the history, but also looking forward um, in, in terms of like change in tech. And tech has always been in, integral to my uh, work. And I've always promoted it within education, um, especially during the turn of the century. There is like the digital divide that was facing brown and black communities. So that was something else that I tried to get to, to uh, alleviate that gap and bring more Mexicanos, more people of color towards a, a technological future because that's where you find your freedom and you find your groups of who you identify with and, and also support. So I saw technology as, as really important in terms of like, um, both my practice and practice of the future for students and such. Um, so those are the, the, the two main ones. Thank you, Felisa. Uh, Sarah, how do you feel your piece represents in this show? Uh, so um, I, I sent two pieces that are part of a kind of a larger body of work that is grounded a little bit like an arte povera style. Because I, you know, think that the reality is um, growing up in barrios and whether it's in Mexico or in Texas, when you don't have a lot, when you're a kid, um, the way you participate in this a little bit like uh, what you were saying about, um, you know, looking towards science fiction or to films or to playing games, we use just the objects around us. Um, or our basic culture to to give ourselves agency. And um, so I really like the everyday things that are part of my neighborhood. Um, that's where I find the futurism. Um, I like to to see how those things mimic both the past and sort of are a nod to the future. And um, the two pieces that I sent in, which are called Consafos and Code Switch, are um, really about the kind of imaginative ways that our communities, uh, Chicano communities, um, uh, give themselves agency. And so the first piece um, that I have there, which is just uh, based on a collage of um, 
a vision serpent uh, that's emerging from a paleta cart was the genesis for an actual sculpture I made with a vision serpent that's created out of a piñata attached to uh, a paleta cart. And my paleta cart is the chariot to the future, which is connected to the past. Um, and I, I mean that sincerely, again, like theater, you know, when I, when uh, in this neighborhood that I live in in Dallas is very rapidly becoming gentrified and, um, uh, you know, things are disappearing uh, recently. Um, and, and this has happened, I know, in a lot of cities where our, our, our paleta, um, you know, vendors have been hit by cars and things like that. And it really pains me because what I see in something as simple as that gesture is this actually um, with vendors, uh, and I grew up in Mexico City hearing them calling people out to sharpen their knives, to sell food. They are sort of the modern incarnation of those ancient marketplaces where people did the same things. And um, it's, a, it's a social theater. Again, I come from a, a, a place of theater. So for me, this collapsing of the multiverse is really goes back to, um, you know, our, our indigenous ancestors were star travelers, but, you know, they, did, they went inwards. They, they did journeys inwards and opened up portals um, to connect with their ancestors. And that's what I see the vision serpent as. It is, uh, you know, these are our, our cosmic travelers who are able to travel far beyond their bodies. And, and I feel that in our communities, they are still with us, but they manifest in ways that are in the most kind of simple and, you know, what we think of as very mundane. So for me, the paleta um, vendor or any of these vendors, they are, without knowing it, repeating the, you know, traditions and these kind of ancient spaces um, in a way, they're more than just vendors. To me, it's a, it's a social uh, gift and um, they, they bring nourishment, they bring joy, they bring connectivity, people gather around them. Um, and so I equate these two, two things together. And um, the other piece that I have, Code Switch, is it's a little bit the same thing. You know, I grew up with my uncles watching a lot of Lucha Libre. I lived around the corner from um, well, a few blocks away when I was a kid from uh, one of the main Lucha Libre places in, uh, in Colonia Roma. And we used to go. And um, you know, as a kid, those were our cosmonauts. Uh, you know, they were our superheroes. And um, so I see those masks um, as kind of the same idea as the masks of the uh, of the cosmonauts of, of, of you know, in our imagination, um, people who could travel to the stars. Um, they had their own language, it was their own culture. It's a way, it was a type of uh, agency when I was a kid. Um, and I, I wanted to pay homage to that, but the idea of Gonzapos, of being protected, of protecting your community, um, of having this language, again, you know, I've, I all of these are based on just photographs that I take in my neighborhood. So I've taken just pictures of, um, of the mascaras from the Lucha Libre, of the, um, you know, um, tagging that's just right around the corner from me, of the paleta carts. Those are all objects that are actually coming out of my environment. Um, but I create a kind of a, a theater um, in my mind uh, that I want to share with others. And uh, so both, I think both the paleta cart, the vendors um, that walk the streets, they are opening up that connection to the past um, through their active presence in the community. Um, same with with the spectacle and the theater of uh, a place where people go to to be together to celebrate. Um, these are they're very simplistic homages to to the kind of agency that communities seek. You know, when you don't have a lot, um, I've printed these on a, a kind of a vellum 
um, papers so they're transparent and I want them to be somewhere between, uh, you know, they're kind of ghostly. They're there, but they're not there. They're blueprints from the past and the future. So that's a kind of a humorous pastiche of these things, but um, I do feel like spaces are real. Uh, people activate those spaces. So theater is, um, you know, spectacle or places where we come together. I, I would just close by saying that um, I really liked this idea of, of the agency, but I think, you know, uh, we can get we can get lost in the idea of of science and technology in and of itself as um, you know being somehow what gives you agency. But what I think really gives people agency is is their is their collectivity, because I think all of that right now is um, you know being used in the service of capitalism, and really ultimately that is very destructive for our communities. And what I find um, powerful to draw from, uh, from indigenous culture was again, technology in the service of the cosmos, not in the service of, you know, making money. So um, I guess that would be the distinction, probably why I like working with low, uh, I don't know what the word would be like, lowbrow techniques. Um, I, I find them very interesting. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, so for Angel, he hasn't created a new piece for this show, but um, I will let him explain that for you. Um, so that's not it. That's the <laughs> performance for tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> uh, so um, like I said, I grew up in El Paso. I always found the borderlands to be like these magical lands where it was like a great place of cultures to interact and learn how to get get along. Uh, growing up uh, in El Paso, we went to Juarez all the time. We had family, we had friends there. Uh, my cousins dated luchadors, so it was great because they'd make us masks. <laughs> um, and it's not like that anymore. I have students now that are in their 20s that have never been to Juarez, and it's weird. Um, and it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, but during one of my exhibitions that I had in Las Cruces, um, I met a uh, migrant lawyer, an immigration lawyer, and we were talking about my work and her work, and she started telling me about how um, some of her clients, some of the my, uh, immigrants, were deported in the middle of um, their while they were applying for refugee status. Mm -hmm. And she's lost contact with them. But you know, when Homeland Security would take them, they would take all their personal belongings and give them to the lawyer. Mm -hmm. And then they'd deport them, and the lawyer stuck with all of their mm -hmm. belongings. And it's up to the lawyer to try to locate them. And they can't. Mm -hmm. And so this lawyer I was talking to had been holding on to items for five years. And so she was asking, she was told that she had to de destroy them. Mm -hmm. And so I asked if I could take the pieces to make a piece. And so she asked, it was signed off, that I could take these pieces. And so um, this piece is more dystopic. Um, it references, um, I don't know if you all watched Star Trek, mm -hmm. um, if you watched uh, Next Generation. Um, but it references Star Trek and 1984. Um, so it's titled Five Lights. And if you've watched Next Generation where Captain Picard gets uh, captured by the Cardassians, he's essentially tortured and they attempt to brainwash him by showing him four lights and asking him how many lights he sees. And they keep telling him that it's actually five. Mm -hmm. And they try to break his will in this manner. Um, and, it's, and, and, the, and that is, of course, referencing 1984 when they would show four fingers and ask you how many you would see and tell you that it's actually five. Mm -hmm. So this piece is uh, an American flag made out of steel uh, behind the fence with the Homeland Security symbol on it. Um, above it are four lights, four very bright floodlights, um, blinding you from the actual stories that are actually happening. And below it, in 
small cubes are the personal belongings of each immigrant that came here for help. And yet, we don't get to see those stories. Instead, we're blinded by the rhetoric that's happening. Um, so you can actually see what they were trying to do and see part of their story within each book. So that's the piece that I'm writing for that one. Um, and then on a more positive note, uh, the portal is more about um, bringing in the people from my alternative universe into this one through that sacred portal to help you celebrate who we are, to inspire you to look into yourselves in your, your own ancestral and indigenous roots and really celebrate who and what we can and are. Thank you, Angel. Uh, for Sarah, um, she also made a new piece for this exhibition, going in a new type of series, uh, going more into her culture. Uh, Sarah, tell us a little bit about your new piece. Okay, so my piece is a sculpture of a face um, wrapped in a beautiful material on a, a futuristic example of a book because I believe in the future we'll be moving further and further away from actual paper. So it represents a digital book. Um, and it's supposed to represent uh, how classes will be taught in the future. And it's specifically United States history. Uh, a lot of us know a lot of the history is uh, not absolutely true and it's whitewashed and whatnot. So the face, uh, she has, uh, I guess, an eyepiece that's gold and has jewels to represent, uh, I guess, her financial class. She's uh, pretty wealthy, but um, she's a moor. And um, so far what I've learned about the Moors, they are different races, but the one I'm focusing on is a, uh, it's African Muslim. Um, and they were very intelligent, wealthy. They uh, brought Europe out of the Dark Ages. And um, so, that's what she represents, a moor, um, I guess, in the future. And how that will be included in the history classes, because I don't recall learning, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't recall learning a lot of positive stuff about Africans or African Americans. So um, I see that as being included um, a lot of positive information about the Moors and um, other races um, and the truths uh, as well. But I lost my train of thought. <laughs> A futuristic version of it. So, um, and since I am descended from the Moors, it is also part of my own history. So I'm learning more about that as well. And um, I might go further into that in the future and create more pieces. But um, that's it for me. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we'll go to Luis's piece, which is a ceramic rocket. This is that's this is a the she uh, number two. I um, um, my father taught me how to make molds in the in, in the shop, so we could uh, have different figurines and um, during the seasons. And these uh, molds made objects that were used for the cultural practices, the the, the customs. Uh, that we uh, did, had and celebrated. So um, 
when I uh, decided to make this piece, I, I uh, worked primarily uh, using paper mache forms, and, and uh, uh, I made this piece at the same about twenty some years ago. Um, at the same time that I made a calavera, and um, and uh, some a few other sculptures that I continue to reproduce and rearrange. Um, I made the calavera into a ceramic uh, a mold so I could cast it, and I've cast many since, and I've got a whole developed body of work with that calavera. But the sister uh, figure, which was the rocket, um, stayed on the shelf for about 20 years, and then uh, I brought it back uh, uh, a little bit before the pandemic, um, um, and I uh, made a gorilla mold uh, out of the piece, and then I made an actual mold and began to cast. Uh, these forms and, and initially the form was based uh, out of um, inspired by the avocado pod um, that I would see outside in, in the yard when my mom would plant the avocados uh, so that uh, we could sell them. See everything everything at the house was used to sustain our livelihood and everything that we did and we learned to do was used to sustain the livelihood. We, everybody had a job in the ceramic shop uh, based on how old you were. So once you got better at uh, one thing, you were moved up to the next job and then everybody else got, you know, it just depended on how well you got at, at making things. So um, this process and the, the, what I learned to do, I transmitted into what I'm doing. And I believe that a lot of, of Chicano futurists really do this by creating objects that have a mnemonic quality to them. These these objects that we make inspire or have hidden stories that, that um, as a collective, we remember or we understand. And um, uh, because uh, they're collective experiences that we have as Mexican Americans in, in, in uh, the United States, and also uh, dealing with um, our ancestors as well, they're, they're telling the stories. Uh, when my, my dad met Pancho Villa he, he, when he was a kid, because he was born in 1909, and my, my parents, my Family members were involved in the revolution, and 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 so um, they were escaping it. And um, they had ranchitos down in, in northern Mexico, and and so when that was going on, that you know the, the, he he met them and they come by. But these are the stories that contribute to um, the drive that I see that a lot of futurists have. That you reach back into the story of who you are, where you came from, and then what you're doing right now. And then what, what are you gonna do into the future? Um, I, I know that we use the word future so much that, that, that it almost just, um, it, it, it doesn't make the impact that it should make because we're constantly moving into it. And, and, but when we make those objects that have the mnemonic qualities, it gives us a chance to be able to have something that can hold the story that can be understood by others that have had this collective experience. Like Lisa, you were saying uh, about how uh, there's hidden information within uh, your work and how you arrange it. That I know that Anka, you do the same thing. I, I just just from listening to you describe how you're arranging things, you do the same thing. And uh, Ivan too, también. Yep. So um, this is happening, and I see it as a collective. And so when these objects that we may become, uh, are shown, then they, they can relate. I mean, who knows who, what anyone's gonna think about that, no, un unless you've seen avocado pits, or if you've cut your head trying to get one out of the, <laughs> out of the, out of the body. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you, you've seen a pit, but we, we had these pits that were pawas, and pawas are real special avocados. You can eat the skin, and they're sweet, and they're juicy, and it feels like heaven when, they, when it's in your tongue and you, you chew on it. And, and it, that memory um, is what I get whenever I look at my pieces and when I hold them. There, there's, when we make objects as sculptors, we, we uh, I can correct me, uh, you do the same thing too, you make things that you can either hold or you can look at in awe, and, and because it reminds you of something. And so when it, this rocket was just that, it could be a munition or it could be a seed. It could be a vessel that transports a, a humanity into the cosmos or it could be a vessel that destroys humanity. And, and, and this ambiguity and this, this delicate balance between between uh, peace and destruction, and this is that's that line that we ride whenever we 
try to create works that are impactful and, and that we pull out from inside of us, that come from our background, that come from our experiences as, as artists, as young individuals growing up and taking in everything that we grew up with, you know, um, and, and so the Street Battle Rocket was my attempt or my idea and my, my, my stance at becoming uh, um, the first Chicano in the rocket manufacturing industry. And, and, and I'll just say it like that because who's the other Chicano doing it? No one's making rockets. Well, I guess I best make them, right? So, um, and, and that's the whole thing about Chicano futurism is being able to, to once you observe, and we're going back to quantum physics, once you observe something, you've changed it and you affect it. And this is what we do when once you observe something and once you make it, you affect it. Once you release that, the, the, the scroll, that spiritual scroll that's related to in, in all the, uh, the, um, in the codices, that, that those are magical words that we emanate because they, they have power. And, and we as a, a community must remember to use these words of power in order to heal our community because at the end of the day, we're all gonna be brown. At the end of the day, there's no, we're gonna be brown. We're all gonna intermingle. I'm a printmaker. Um, I, I do large scale printmaking using um, asphalt rollers so I can bring the community together and I use a cultural tool called the plunge router and, and the plunge router is not a tool that's accepted by most uh, relief printmakers um, as, as a tool to carve but it is my cultural tool because when I was going to school and, and there's uh, many other Chicanos that, that took shop and they, they carved out their, their last name and took it home. Look, mom, look, dad, and they would hang it up. That's a cultural tool. We all use our cultural tools that we have available to us. Mm -hmm. And each one of us has those. Lisa, you, the, 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 the glitter, which is really mirrors. Wow, that's a cultural, that's a cultural medium. You know, uh, observing the, the, the paleteros, the eloteros, and, and all these people that are part of our history and are part of our everyday existence and then are part of our dreams as well. And, and the, that, those are our, that's our cultural material that we mold and turn into either the objects that have mnemonic qualities or, or the pieces that hang in the wall and, and represent our stories. So the, with the rocket, I had, in this particular installation, I had it coming out of a black hole. And, and that's how powerful my rockets are. The rockets that I've imagined from the seeds, of, uh, avocado seeds that my mother planted. And so, and, and, there, and, and she's the inspiration because of that. And so we all reach back to that. And, and we have that, and that's a quality I believe is really um, going to be something that, that um, is, is you'll find across the board with a lot of Chicano futurists. Well, thank you, Louis. I have to go back to Mexico and try to find those avocados. I've never <laughs> had my, those before. My mom plants them every season. Uh -huh. We've had really bad seasons lately because she, uh, uh, it's froze and, and mm. uh, the wind's down there. But next time so I go we're down, come visit. yes, yes, <laughs> definitely, because she she single-handedly spread avocados across the Rio Grande Valley for the past forty years. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. well, well, thank you so much, uh, Ivan. Tell us about your piece. Sure. Uh, I guess my piece is a metaphor for all those masks we have to like use when dealing with. Uh, our social environment sometimes there could be a little bit harsh um, but also trying to like to bond that um, stereotype that uh, men in, in Mexican culture has to be tough and it has to be real macho you know so I, I try to keep that like menacing look but uh, if you look into the little eye that's an electronic eye right there um, you can see it moving and, and looking around kind of nervous. So yeah, I was trying to use that as a metaphor, like, you know, mm, we don't have to continue following the, those stereotypes. I mean, uh, not all Mexican you know, people are, are machistas. Uh, 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 a lot of change is, is, is being done on, on culture uh, over there. But uh, still, a, a, lot, a lot of work to do. And then over here also, you know, like people Think like all all immigrants or all, at least all Mexican people are 
are really tough or they're in a gang or they're, um, I don't know, like real macho and in reality it's, it's sort of different. I mean, each person is different. Uh, sometimes we're just like, um, uh, I think, uh, sorry, I sorry, forget my, my words. Um, yes, like, uh, Uh, part of the that environment that forces to wear those masks, you know. Uh, it's important for me to use uh, um, um, the materials. I use a lot of recycled materials. I try to limit myself. I think that pushes me a little bit more creative to use whatever I have just to figure out how, how to make it work. Uh, I did use a lot of mixed media materials. I use a lot of uh, mechanical elements, electronics. Uh, I do use a lot of, a little bit of coding in my in some of my sculptures. Um, uh, yeah, and I submitted another one. Uh, yes. They're called chrysalidas, basically cocoons, and that's also a, a, a metaphor. And it basically talks about two things. One is the change, the transformation, and the opportunity and liberty that this country has to offer to all immigrants, but also is uh, a critique to that uh, notion or that is required you to leave your culture behind to be considered uh, a true American, I guess, if you're like still showing up your culture or uh, speaking Spanglish or stuff like that, some people like, then they don't accept that they, they think you should be completely a new person and just take that uh, assimilation of the culture. But uh, yeah, I think I, that's what I'm trying to say with my, my pieces. And the cocoon pieces are two, about what, three foot? Uh, yeah, three feet. Uh, they're resin, bar top resin, I cast, uh, cast them, and they're in a like, pyramid form, I guess. Uh, it has some uh, lights in it and some uh, fun objects. I do a lot of um, assemblage. Uh, so when I was growing up, um, we didn't, didn't have a lot of resources. So most of the times I, uh, I'll either make my own toys or disassemble toys that are, they won't work in anymore and, and make new ones. So I can have a, a lot of fun. And I think that's part of uh, what has influenced my practice until now that necessity of uh, trying to create something to, to go on, you know. Okay. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Ivan. Uh, so I would like to mention the five other artists that couldn't make it out here, um, but I still want them to be represented mm -hmm. in our talk, um, and I can show you their artwork here now. So this piece is by Quentin Gonzalez, who we're, um, which is from Colorado. He creates uh, these digital images, but also having some assistance from AI technology. So with this image, he wanted to represent uh, uh, what he believes Chicano futurism means in the future. And the, fl the full flourishment of the roses and the flowers in the background shows a positive, almost utopic dynamic to what he feels this would look like. Um, the details in the face, uh, along with the earrings and along with the, the chest tattoo, um, it's all super high quality detailed. Um, if you happen to go to see the show and look at this piece in person, the picture doesn't really do it justice. Just as for like all the, all the pictures I have for everybody's pieces, you have to see them in person to not only get the sense of what it means, but to feel it because you can also feel pieces. Um, this is by Caetano Valenzuela, which is also the creator of the Latinx Secular Fiction Conference poster. Mm -hmm. So if you've seen that around campus, uh, this artist, I reached out to him and I told him about my uh, exhibition. He's like, I want to be a part of that. I'll do anything. <laughs> so he actually created this new piece, is uh, acrylic on a wood panel. Um, 
super high detailed in mechanics, but also Mesoamerican ideology. This one is by Jaime Chavez, which is acrylic on wood, and he calls this piece Ese Turkey. <laughs> so a lot of Jaime's pieces are very, uh, like uh, Sarah said, um, having that humor. And I'm realizing more and more as seeing everybody's artwork, there is a humor in everybody's uh, artwork if you really go deep into it. And Heimer really loves to play on that humor. So a lot of his work are Chola or Cholo-esque uh, people in uh, garments, but with either a Mesoamerican head or um, type of um, accessory. Um, and he just creates these image, uh, what are those little toys that were like? Homies. Homies. <laughs> kind of like the homie little figures, you know, like, but they have that Mesoamerican influence, uh, which he felt like, uh, when I was talking to him, of a type of Chicano featureism. So this piece is just, it's, it's amazing, I love it. Um, this piece is an acrylic on wood again. Uh, this is by Laura Alvarez. She is from California. Um, Laura is primarily a printmaker, uh, but she does do some type of paintings. Um, this piece called Double Agent Servienta. Um, she created this uh, type of maid that um, she goes on different adventures, um, whether it be action, whether it be um, something um, sad or something happy. Uh, I picked this piece specifically because the her character, which she calls Das, um, goes into a pod like and goes into space and tries to figure out um, a certain question in her mind of like who is she? Where does she come from? Not just here on this earth, but what if we are from another planet in a sense? Um, so she got her character and sent her off to space. And it, there you can see she's stepping out into this new era that she doesn't know herself and just is going for it. So now we'll get into um, audience participation. Mm -hmm. A lot of the students here are involved in a, a bio art and design class and we're looking at biology and biotechnology and I just want to say I appreciate so much the depth of knowledge in this panel it's it's kind of mind but mind boggling <laughs> just to hear you know kind of scratching of the surface of the the knowledge that you all have um, but I wonder if I could ask you to speak to from your perspective and from the Chicano Futurist perspective about um, biology and biotechnology. I, I've heard, you know, uh, Angel talked about the corn, of course the avocado seeds, the curandera, um, the idea of going inward and when you're exploring the universe was really something that made me think about biology and biotechnology that Sarah talked about. So I wonder if you could expand on some of those ideas or, or talk about some another perspective that you might have? Um, I, I'd like to start. I'd like to answer that if possible. Um, okay, um, two things. Um, more I'm going to focus on the biology part. Um, one of the things um, I've noticed uh, differences in indigenous thought and say Western thought is in directly connected in terms of biology. Um, both flora and fauna and the land itself is conscious within indigenous cultures, um, within Mexica culture, uh, within our codices, the animals, the plants are personalities. They have, they are, they are agents. Um, and it's taken a really, really long time for the West to come to that fact. And it's slowly been coming to it. So whenever I was in college and if I said something like, oh, my Nana who was a curandera taught me that the land, the plants and animals have language and have consciousness. 
if I said that in any of my science classes, I would have been laughed out. Um, <laughs> that would have been unacceptable. Um, yet recently we found out that in, in terms of like forests, there's a matriarch tree that feeds her community and her family. And she decides where the nutrients go. And she talks to the other trees through vibrations and she's in command. So there's, there's an exact, uh, example of indigenous thought coming to prevalence within Western framework, yet the Western framework took a really long time to get there. Um, the same with the consciousness of animals. Um, only recently, I think they were looking at, um, I believe it was fish, that they found out that fish have a language. Now, my Nana, who only had an eighth grade education, she was born during, uh, again, the turn of the century, she's a revolutionaria. She used to sing revolutionary songs to me. She would say, of course, fish have languages. It doesn't mean that we know what the language is, but they have language. Um, and so I've been seeing science in terms of biology and within the flora systems um, coming to these facts. And um, I had to sit back because of colonialism. I couldn't bring this up because at the time in the 80s and in the 90s, I would have been scoffed at. Um, so I just kept it to myself, but now I'm, I'm, I'm seeing it come, come to fruition. So, uh, that's one part in, in terms, so it, within my own work, and I know within the work of many of the artists here, um, I use animals and flora and specific plants, um, as entities within my own work and agents within the universe itself. I like what you said, Lisa. I think, um, you know, it's it's interesting to think about indigenous cultures having that relationship. I guess, you know, the technical term they always use are psychopomps, where you have like uh, animal agency or, or an extension of you or, you know, this relationship with, um, with the intelligence uh, on the earth. So it's, you know, um, I think in science fiction, Western uh, paradigms, there's this kind of search for artificial, I mean, there's a search for intelligent life outside of the earth or an emphasis on artificial intelligence as sort of a technological um, kind of advancement of uh, or extension of human life. But I think within, uh, the agency, again, that we were discussing within Chicano culture, that is um, turned rather than outward, it's inward. It's uh, this it, um, knowledge that advanced intelligence already exists on our planet, that those aliens are already here in our oceans, and there are the other species that are on the same level as us. Um, our intercommunication with them is um, again, you know, this kind of idea that you can do inward traveling, inward cosmic traveling, not just necessarily, you know, going out literally off of the planet, but that we can um, travel through time and space in other ways. And I think that kind of freedom, especially for communities that have suffered uh, a lot of physical deprivation and the spoliation of their environments is um, something that I find as a thread in, in um, futurist aesthetics. The reason that, you know, for, I think, especially uh, you can see this in uh, Afrofuturism, um, it is precisely because the body was enslaved that the spirit cannot be, that you can travel, you are free. Um, and I think that, that that long history that we have in our indigenous communities to uh, travel cosmically, bend time and space to connect to ancestors, to connect with the planet, it's, a, it's an alternate um, type of intelligence and it's an alternate understanding of, of biology. Um, so. I have a, a, a question for the panel in general. Um, I'm mestizo, and so I'm looking at things through not necessarily um, a binary lens, but more of a gradient lens, uh, and trying to make sense of those two opposites, right? And so in relation to, we go back to first contact, um, 
and looking at things from a technological perspective, the sword, the steel, the horse, those are really important elements from a technological perspective. I'm curious now, in terms of your personal work, how do you integrate technology and is it a metaphor for anything larger? I mean, I made a whole universe um, <laughs> that, that changes on the point of, I mean, honestly, I don't really think colonization really worked just because of the horse and the steel. I think a lot of it was um, smallpox and plague. Um, and so within my own universe, um, there's a turning point where they actually learn about disease in time to quarantine and isolate so that they can actually fight back. And given the numbers and the intelligence that the Mayans had and then collectively uniting with the Mexica, the Inca, and then going out and reaching out into all other indigenous tribes using all of their collective knowledge, they're not, they're, they're undefeatable. Um, so, I mean, I don't, for me, it's, it's like really looking into the sciences of what they had, you know, the fact that they already had that concept of zero. And if you continued that concept, where would our mathematics be? considering that at that point in time in Europe, the concept of zero was considered blasphemy. You know, so if you continue with that and, and not, not make that advancement of science for political or monetary gain, but for the uplifting of everyone altogether, working together, you know, I feel you can advance a lot faster than you can if the, this is for me and me alone. So, that's right. Bianca, I didn't really hear the question. Could you? What was the question? Uh, the role of technology, essentially, in your work. The role of technology in your work. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have an answer to that? Or? Yeah, I guess uh, I think in my work, I use technology depending on, on, on my vision or what I, what I want to create. So, um, in, in, I, I usually, usually use it even are either as a subject matter or as a material, right? Um, for me, it's really important, important to integrate technologies um, because it's, it's inevitable that we have that future uh, coming, right? We're, we're expanding our knowledge and, and, and in different fields. So I think like in most everything has to evolve. So art by itself has to evolve, right? And then use those tools that are available, like uh, laser cutters, uh, uh, coding. Uh, there's so much out there that we can use and create wonderful work and 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 try to inspire other, other people and to, to use those tools to explore and experiment. Yeah, I, mean, I like what you said about, I want to add to that because it, it's about exploration and, and it's about exploration in, in, the te in the technologies that you're comfortable with because um, in like for example in my work I'm, I, uh, I'm, I'm not tech savvy I'm, uh, to a certain degree as much as a teacher can get in the, in the school room because we have to deal with projectors and computers and all that to make sure that the class is taught properly but um, when you experiment with technologies and add them into your into your work, it, it it brings part of who you are out to it. Just like how you experiment with the technologies and how you bring back the materials that you use. In my case, like uh, it's it's simple. It's something as simple as tools. Um, for example, I just told you earlier about using the plunge router, which is a technology. Uh, it, it's not an IT technology, but it's a technology that um, goes beyond the acceptable. Um, status quo of what a printer should yeah. use to carve and and I've been doing that for since 2005 um, so it's what technology you're comfortable using with to make sure that you relay what you're saying if, if I had to say anything uh, about how we use technology and how I use it in my my work as well I mean I think a big part especially when it comes to technology is that um, one it's a sense of adventure um, I'm a big person uh, uh, in that I let the concept dictate 
the materials, the technology that's needed within it. Um, have laser cutter will use, you know. Yeah. Um, you you look at it and and I was I was actually talking to one of my students the other day about traditional forms of art and I go well you know you're going to use what's at hand, you know if somebody had given Michelangelo a die grinder back in the day, he would have used it. It's like nobody wants to be there just like this all the time, you know. You can, you're going to use what you have, and and learn it and and I I I get this great sense of adventure of like. Well, what can I do with this tool that you're not supposed to do with it? You know, and I, and I think that's a really great thing that artists do. It's like, give me this, let me play with it. Don't even tell me how to use it, just let me play with it, and I'm gonna find a way to utilize it to make artwork. Um, and, and that's why like, you have things like glitch videos, and, and you have like, um, people that are just putting mechanics together and, and saying, well, let's see what this does. You know, it's it's this sense of adventure to create that, you know, your vision, and and not not necessarily going well. This is how it has to be done. It's like okay, you showed me how it has to be done. Let me play with it now and break that technology to remake it. It's that what if? It's that what if? Right there. What if? We're constantly saying that. You know, whether we know it or not, we're constantly, as artists that are producing, we're constantly saying that. And I think that's one of the things that comes out in all, everybody's work, because uh, how else could you combine and create something that's different and new and collects objects that are already there from before? What if? <laughs> I, I, I also like to address that. Oh, Sara, I don't know if you were, if oh. I interrupted me. Okay. Um, uh, I use technology in almost every aspect of art making. Um, and I, I, I wanted to bring up Siqueiros, um, the painter, the muralist, um, David Alfaro. He was one of the first uh, people to promote, uh, the, I, I wouldn't say the use of technology, but the use of, of new materials. Um, he came to New York City and taught um, Jackson Pollock, how to paint on the floor and how to make drip paintings. Um, so Siqueiros was one of the forefront um, artists in terms of bringing on the modernist movement and the abstract movement in, within New York City. And not many art historians or people know that fact, that Siqueiros was the one to do that. So um, I follow Siqueiros uh, in terms of concepts and in terms of philosophy, of course. Um, and I also imparted it into, in, to my students, um, like Angel, um, that everything is at your fingertips. Use the technology. Use what's there. Um, my work wanted to defy technology. And um, I started working with the rise of the Internet and the rise of the computer. Um, so I wanted to create something that couldn't be um, uh, put onto the computer, could it be, that it actually had to be physically seen. Uh, because in my work, I say that the people seeing it and the place imparts to how it is seen. Um, so it can't exist within the computer. Yet I use the computer for everything. I use it I, right now. I have like I'm mentoring. I don't know how many people I have like across the world. I have friends in Mongolia. I'm learning Chinese. You know, uh, the computer is there. It, it's the educational tool par excellence. You are now in control of your own education. And I try to tell that to my students all the time. You don't need me per se. You just need to know the right questions. Um, so technology is super important um, in, in terms of like advancement and um, bringing ourselves, bringing Chicanos, bringing brown and black folks again to the future and having that accessibility that was once denied within the cultural itself. Like we couldn't access this. We had to wait for library books for nine months to get a library book from like across the US. Okay, so I, I don't have that. I don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to do that as people. We can teach ourselves. We don't have to rely on like racist institutions to tell us what, what we need to know. We can now find out what there is out there by many multiple points of view and many educators. We don't have to be confined within the institution itself. So I see technology as a, as a key to opening our consciousness, our minds, and furthering ourselves forward within 
structures that have tried to contain us. I was also going to add that I think um, something that I've always admired about Chicano culture in particular, but it is the aesthetic that comes out of places that have lacked, um, you know, for lack of better word, what they say, the developing world or the infrastructure. So you see this happen a lot in Cuba and places where there's a limitation of materials. So technology um, in historically has been this uh, raw material or this um, thing that has represented wealth or advancement or, you know, um, uh, some sort of status symbol. I'm even thinking of, you know, even, even something like the car that we all have. Well, the reason that you have, you know, uh, people altering trucks or altering uh, cars that, that come out of that Rascuachi culture is uh, an inventiveness of, of taking what is a limitation and actually reimagining it in this like really super fantastical way that may be the complete opposite of um, what it was intended for. And that, I really, really love that aesthetic because it is again, a way of taking a situation of um, having lacking and then flipping it on its head and making it your power. Um, so that is something that I think is a really unique feature to Chicano culture is, is um, taking something very simple and it doesn't have to be high tech, but you can make it look high tech or you can take something very high tech and use it for something um, very fantastical and not what it's intended for as you know as some of our artists have suggested but that that's just such a great aesthetic and and I love that uh inventiveness and I think that's also uh within the kind of toolkit of futurism that I hope for for not just for Chicanos but for for our planet is to is to just take what we already have we don't need to you know go crazy it's like what's the point is we're all here to try to have a, a the best life that we can and to you know refocus our energy in in creative ways so so that creativity is is directly tied to that imaginative use of materials thank you there great question oh. uh we think we oh sorry. Uh -huh. go ahead I was just going to say that I use technology in my piece, uh, the lights, not only to uh, draw the eye, but to represent a future way, a futuristic way of learning, a new way of learning. Um, so knowledge, um, and that's pretty much what I want to add to it. Okay. Uh, I think we have time for one more question from the audience for everybody to talk about. Um, one more question. I, I just have a random thought, a random comment to share. I, I resonate with uh, what you said earlier about the word Chicano and the identity of Chicano, like it, depending on where you're at, it's either positive or negative. Um, and so I, I found that, and it's still still with me, right? I think, I don't know how it, if it's still a C in Mexico, but if you're Chicano, it's it has sort of like these negative uh, connotations. Um, and then another random thought, with the panadero, panadero. Um, oh, let, let me just uh, tell them that first thought you had. Sure. So uh, her first thought was the um, idea of like the utopic or dystopic view of Chicano uh, culture. Identity. I, yeah, culture identity. Where you're at, right? Yeah. Positive or negative. Yeah, and the like positive or negative view of it, and then she had another thought about Sarah's uh, panadero. Yes, I, I I appreciate what you said about how you know uh, el paletero and the chariot and the and the um, what's it called where the paletas are you know it's sort of like a in a place where you know it's a joy and a positive experience but there is also um, a sad side to that because el paletero you know here. Um, they, they, they come here as 
as an indentured servant, I don't think they make even 30 cents on each paleta. So they already come like with this debt and then they get this job to be a paletero mm -hmm. and it's just like they just, I don't know, like there's this other side to, to that that I, that I see. Yeah. So she was describing your paletero and that the, the sense of like the good and the bad out of it, describing um, people that actually work for paleteros and sell paletas, you know, that they hardly make anything and they're trying to support themselves and their family by just selling paletas, which are popsicles. Um, and it being a hard life, you know, for, for those that are struggling just to sell ice cream, you know, and the discrimination that they get for certain places that they can and cannot sell ice cream. So it's, she was just admiring your piece and what it meant to her. Yeah, I actually, um, it is precisely because of the people who are invisible or who have those really hard jobs, um, like, uh, you know, people who are, who are construction workers, who are gardeners, who are paleteros. I see them actually, at, that's why I'm making a connection to that vision serpent, to that Mayan ancestor, because they are, um, they are the you know, we, we imagine these ancient cultures as something in the past or, you know, that they have these technologies in the past, but we're just a long thread, a long line. So I, I see actually sometimes the people who are doing this work that is very low paying, that may be very humble, they're actually the ones who are carrying the culture. So it is people who are cooking, who come from the long line of cooks and tradition of, uh, or, or agricultural workers who are carrying all that knowledge that comes, that technology, actually, if you want to look at it that way, from the Mayans, from the Mexica, from, they're usually the ones who are transmitting that. And so that is precisely why I like to use these kind of very folk motifs, because I feel like our future um, is running in spite of all of the hardships and oppressions, we, 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 our, our communities carry that, they carry it forward, and they carry it, and it's often transmitted through the most humble people. Um, so my futurism is directly connected to those very individuals. They're the ones who are, who are the transmitters of the culture. A paletero is a transmitter of culture from the past, and they are the nave espacial into the future. Um, so that, that, that isn't really a cart to me. It is more like, you know, when we talk about spaceships, you imagine these sort of futuristic spaceships, but I see that vehicle navigating the streets and for me it's actually kind of like a vessel from the past in a journey a continuity in the present and it is our future as well so that is how I imagine that piece I know it's difficult to look at sometimes these these things because they they also are moored in a reality of of um of hardship but uh I, I see each and every one of those individuals, some said is dignos, and they are, I completely, I'm just, that's why I, I, I want to honor them with my work, because they are, they're, they are the connection to the past. Anybody else? Can I just want to say about the, the cuete, the avocado? To me, it looks like it's coming out of a poinsettia. Like. Yeah, <laughs> um, it, it, that is the, that is the red uh, foil used on uh, oh. on flower arrangements. Whenever you you go by uh, the funeral, yeah, well, you see my funeral houses. My dad was a funeral uh, was an embalmer for twenty five years, so uh, um, we got lots of those stories too. But the the flowers, the the all, yeah, I used a lot of materials that I grew up using ribbons and and uh, foil like that and, uh, with the works to wonder, signify. <laughs> Anybody else have another thought or want to see one of the pieces that they had a question about or just wanted to say something? I, I actually have something. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in the Chicano movement, born in California, raised in the Rio Grande Valley, California, in the Southwest, in Mexico. I'm very much rooted in my indigenous culture, but also my Afro-indigenous culture. 
And one of the things like Chicanismo, I, I missed the first part of it, so I don't know what Chicano commentary was around that, but I, I understand Chicano being like, like being called a pocho, right? Somebody who's mocho, pocho, you're cut off from your culture. And so you're just kind of, I mean, that's how in Mexico people consider, oh, that's a Chicano, is a pocho, someone who mm -hmm. doesn't really know who they are or where they come from, right? In general. Um, and Chicanismo being a, a movement of pride and all this kind of stuff. And in, in, in Texas, South Texas growing up, like Tejanos really didn't know about Chicanismo. When I went down there, they were like, what? And it was a whole different, so, but they started to learn and, and you have what you have now. But here in the Southwest, talking to other indigenous people, um, one of the big things that happens to be a point of, when they hear Chicano, they kind of go, ugh. Not publicly sometimes, not a lot of times in, in people's faces when someone is asserting their Chicanismo, they're kind of like, oh, because of Aztlan. Because the claims of, oh, this is Aztlan, this is where the Mexica. And I do performance art around pieces like that, like have to do with, like, we're not all Aztecs, we're not all Mexica. You know, where some of us are Tinique and Opata and Yoemem and different, and because that's the romantic, you know, the warrior thing. But here, and so my, I just kind of want to hear from you all, like, what you think about that when, because Chicanismo does talk about Aztlan and the claiming of indigenous land of people who are still here, have been here continuously, have their own culture, their own language, and folks that come in sometimes, if you have a thought around that, around Aztlan in the Southwest and, and the claiming of, of, of that, this area as a mythical land of where the Mexica came. And so I, I would really like to hear where, if you have had thoughts, any of y'all, around that. So her, her comment was about um, Aslan and Chicanismos uh, of this area. And if you guys had any um, comments about that. Um, so people in Phoenix have always said Phoenix is Aslan. <laughs> it's a joke <laughs> because almost every city that is in the desert is like, no, we were at Slan first. So <laughs> LA is going to be like, no, we're at Slan. And no, no, no. Phoenix, okay, is was Atlan. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. Um, one of the things is we don't know where Atlan is. Atlan was the myth mythical homeland of the, that the Chichimeca left, right? So the Chichimeca were in the cave, the seven caves, and then the tribes went down south. We don't know. We have some kind of uh, knowledge of where uh, they were initially, but then they went and formed the Nochtitlan. So that's why we have this concept of Aztlan. And so the Mexica, the Chicano movement, took it to heart as like the mythical homeland of the, of the Chicanos that live here. Um, so that, that was part of the Aztlan uh, part. And, and within the Chicano movement, too, in the 60s, how it was defined, and I'm too young to know that. I just know that through his history and through like oral trans transmission, uh, talking to the older uh, Chicanos artists. Um, one was that whenever Chicano was defined, it wanted to be encompass all peoples, all peoples of color that were being left out of the the U.S. culture at the time. So Chicanos were were black people, were native people. I'm of course because Mexica were were native as as well. Um, Asian people were invited over, um, and I'd also like to expand the the con the whole concept of Latinx is a new one. So there's always umbrellas of like what's the new term for the colonialism, right? So Latinx is the colonial umbrella, and I always say that within that colonial umbrella, we need to bring in the Filipinos también because they were co colonized by the Spaniards, so they're Chicanos as well. Um, so that that that's some kind of like um, just a, a brief history of like where the Chicano movement came from and censoring Atlan as that mythical homeland of where we are and it was creating a space for us and for our culture conceptually and within like um, institutions within educational institutions. Well, and then um, I want to add to that. I really appreciate how, how Lisa is talking about the early beginnings, and, and that's what it's at. It, it's a different it, it's a different view wherever you go. It's regional. We're not a, a monolithic uh, group um, of peoples, um, but more importantly, um, it's not a monolithic aesthetic as either. And I think that one of the disservices that happens when we have very few exhibits that put together our, our, our views, our, our, our aesthetic, is that um, overall, people who don't know begin to make assumptions that, oh, that's 
that's what Chicano art is. And so when big collections get uh, traveled around, uh, being stated as the all-inclusive uh, example of what Chicano art is, and it just presents one region of the country, you're doing everybody a disservice. And, and <laughs> exactly. that's, that's what happens when, when and, and, and then you get attitudes and, and ideas mixed in uh, because of the different regions that people have, and even outside of the country. You know, there's, in Japan, there's a growing uh, uh, movement uh, uh, to mimic the Pachuco style. And so the Pachuco style is not the all ending example of what it is to be Chicano. Um, and, and so um, it, it's popular culture, it, it gets mixed up, and unless the person who's observing does the, their due diligence to teach themselves, then uh, it, they're gonna fall short. And so it, uh, at the end of the day, it becomes, it becomes imperative to us as an audience to question ourselves when we view works and to approach works in that manner as opposed to allowing uh, just the status quo continue. Is that a beautiful concept um, that Ansaldua wrote about, about borderlands and the state of mind of, uh, you know, the borderland is a, is a metaphor for the best kind of state of being because you exist in that space between two defined places and that makes you stronger. Um, in, in that space, anybody can occupy it. What is important is that you stay fluid and that you stay boundless and that you're, you, again, back to this idea of past and present collapsing together or being a multiplicity of things. I think that that that's the exciting thing about this exhibition. What attracted me to the idea of it is that it's you know it can be dystopic, it can be utopic, it can be so many things. Um, but I think really the the concept for me is is empowerment through that sort of open ended space um, that you know. You, you can't be defined, you can't be collapsed. You just can reimagine and reinvent. Um, so. Anybody else wanna answer that question? Okay, so uh, we're getting to the time and we're gonna start doing some closing statements that um, each artist would like to say before we go and then I'll give a little speech at the end. So, uh, Lisa, any closing statements you want to make? Oh, I just want to thank everyone and thank you, Bianca, for having me. Um, it was a pleasure to see you all online. <laughs> Again, thank you, technology. Um, and uh, I, I look forward to seeing what is what is coming around in terms of like seeds that have been planted by many of us. So, and and I think that we're actually seeing the fruition now. So it's a very exciting time, finally. <laughs> Thank you. Sarah? Yeah, I, I, I'm honored to be part of this um, experience. I've just learned so much just today. Um, really looking forward to seeing, um, you know, the work of all of these artists. And, and thank you, Bianca. And I'm, I'm so excited for this project. Thank you. Uh, Angel? Uh, it's it's been a really big honor to be a part of this, um, to be showing with the artists that are in here, um, and to be part of something that's I think is showing an, an upward movement for Chicago. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very new experience for me, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, pretty cool uh, representing Afrofuturism. So I look, I look forward to anything uh, in the future. Thank you. Well, I also want to thank you for your hard work, Bianca, and I, I appreciate uh, these ama all these amazing artists that I'm sitting with because all of them are, uh, represent a slice of what, what we're doing. And there's many more. We're just a few that are sitting here, but there's many more that are doing the same hard work 
that we're doing. And um, it, what Bianca is doing by putting together exhibits like this is precisely what uh, me and Jose Esquivel had been talking about, that um, the gatekeepers hold us back. And when we don't get together and combine our resources as a group, we fall behind. And we are not going to be able to get out unless we come together and embrace the multi-generational aspects of who we are and where we're going. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Yeah, I think the same. Thank you so much for reminding me and being part of this amazing panel sharing with amazing artists. Uh, I, I think the only thing I have to say for uh, people who are studying in the arts is get a, 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 a great person to follow, a t-shirt that you can help with, and a, a mentor basically, and work hard. And it's going to pay it off, believe me. Yeah, I think that's all I have to say. <laughs> well, I want to thank you all again. I know I'm going to keep saying it over and over again, but this uh, this whole process and hand selecting all these artists, you know, not just for their their status or their um, their their artwork, but that who they are, because what art you get from an artist, knowing who they are and what they make, makes so much more um, meaning than just you know doing an, uh, a random artist call, especially for this exhibition, I needed to find the artists that I felt connected to in their artwork. And with each artist that sent me their pieces, I'm amazed each time I opened the package and just saw them in person and was, I could feel the energy of them and who they are in their pieces. And that's what it means to me when I, to create this exhibition. So in that, I just want to thank um, SciArt Santa Fe for believing in my topic, you know, and supporting this multiple event uh, for my exhibition, not just having the exhibition itself, but having this talk, being able to bring a live performance and then bringing artwork from around the country to Albuquerque and having people come and talk with artists and get to not just know their work, but to know them because knowing the artist itself with the artwork just gives you that extra oomph in what it means to, to love art. So thank you again, guys. Um, thank you, audience, for coming and spending your time here. Um, it means so much to me and what I've been doing and it's, this is all has been worth it so much. So thank you everybody.